Good morning. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Bienvenidos a la reunión comunitaria para la excelencia. Me llamo Linda Bardier y estoy tan contenta de que estén aquí hoy. No hablo español muy bien. Así que tenemos, um, muy bien, así que tenemos intrépidos con equipo para la intrepidación disponible para ustedes. Por favor, recojan el equipo en la mesa cerca de la entrada y disfrute del programa. Good morning and welcome to the Community Gathering for Excellence. My name is Linda Bardier and I'm so glad that all of you are here today. I don't speak Spanish very well, so I was explaining to our Spanish speaking guests that we have translation equipment available. Again, welcome everyone to the 2015 Gathering for Excellence. I'm so glad that all of you are with us today. It is fitting on this day, the day before Veterans Day, that we pause to honor those who have served our country. I invite you to stand for the presentation of colors by the San Bernardino High School Air Force Junior ROTC, followed by the national anthem performed by the San Bernardino Teen Music Workshop. Please stand for the presentation of colors. as our color guard exits the area. Let's give all of those wonderful students another big round of applause. And you may be seated. I want to give special thanks to our teen music wor workshop. They did an amazing job providing entertainment, as those of you came in early enough for the Continental Breakfast. And I think that we can all agree that our students are amazing, and they are the focus of our work here today. 
I'd like to thank the Cardinal Court from San Bernardino High School and the district's police explorers for their assistance this morning. I, yes, let's give them a round of applause. I would like to ask San Gregorio High School senior Victory Ali to please join me on stage to remind us all of the importance of Veterans Day and serving our country, our community, and our schools. Thank you. Veterans Day, previously known as Armistice Day, marked the end of World War I. On this day, we remember and seek to honor all of those who have served for our country. On that note, I would like to personally thank all of our veterans. Thank you for fighting for my freedom, for protecting my country, and for ensuring the possibility of a better future for generations to come. Unfortunately, on a holiday such as Veterans Day, those of us who haven't served are susceptible to adopting a nonchalant or even apathetic attitude. Yet even now, we are all in the midst of a war, a war which we are called to be soldiers. We, as educators, guiders, and supporters, must stand up and fight for the youth of this community. These battles are not always violent and obvious struggles but rather most manifest themselves covertly in the minds and hearts of our students. These battles are unique and personal for every student, and yet both our community and our country are feeling its effects. Our students are faced with an onslaught of distractions, perhaps more than any preceding generation. Many go home to unimaginable circumstances. Some have family members with alcohol or drug addictions, Others have been or are being affected by gang violence. Many lack parental support and involvement of any kind. And many just struggle daily to feel like they could ever be good enough or succeed. We are fighting this battle, which we must constantly vie for the attention of our youth. I encourage you to consider all these trials the next time you feel frustrated or feel as if you can't fight any longer. We, as a city and a country, have experienced innumerable struggles, yet it has been said that the greater the struggle, the more glorious the triumph. Every day, we must not lose sight of our mission, to bring hope back to our community and to the schools inside it. We must be united and determined in our cause if we are to win this war that has so impacted our country, our community, and our schools. Our students and the future of our city as a whole, are worth our sacrifice. Thank you. Victory is amazing. Thank you, Victory. Victory is another example of the many shining stars in our schools and those who have joined us in this room today. Among us are many people who truly live lives of service. I would like to pause and recognize so many of the dignitaries who are with us today. Our Board of Education members, Board President, Mr. Mike Gallo, Board Vice President, Dr. Margaret Hill. Mrs. Abigail Medina. Dr. Barbara Flores. Mrs. Gwen Rogers. Mrs. Linda K. Savage. Mr. Danny Tillman, and Dr. Scott Wyatt, who was elected by voters this past week and will be sworn into the board next month. Let's give Dr. Wyatt a warm welcome. Thank you. 
With us today is assembly member from the 47th district, assembly member Cheryl Brown. From the 40th district, assembly member Mark Steinorth. From the 32nd District, Member Norma Torres. <laughs> County of San Bernardino, Chief Executive Officer, Greg Devereaux. <laughs> County Board of Supervisors Chairman, James Ramos. Fifth District Supervisor, Josie Gonzalez. Our County Superintendent of Schools, Mr. Ted Alejandre. And representing our County Board of Education, President Mark Sumter. Alan Ritchie. Hardy Brown II. Sherman Garnett, Laura Mancha, and from the San, San Bernardino Community College Board, Board of Trustees President John, Long, John Longville, <laughs> Trustee Clerk Joseph Williams, and Trustees Donna Farrakhan, Gloria Macias Harrison, Dr. Donald Singer, Nicholas Zumbas, and student trustees Esmeralda Vasquez and Thomas Robles. From the city of San Bernardino, our mayor. Carrie Davis. And our city council members, some are with us. I will acknowledge them all. Virginia Marquez, Benito Barrios, John Valdivia, Fred Charette, Henry Nickel, Ricky Van Johnson, and Jim Mulvihill. Let's give them all a big round of applause. City attorney, Gary Sines. From our city police, Chief Jared Bergwan. And today's event would not have been possible if it wasn't for the support and resources from our local education leaders. Let's recognize Chancellor Bruce Barron from the San Bernardino Community College District. Dr. Gloria Fisher, President of San Bernardino Valley College. Dr. Tomas Morales from Cal State San Bernardino. From UC Riverside, Chancellor Kim Wilcox. Dr. Richard Hart from Loma Linda University. And president of Crafton Hills College, Cheryl Marshall. I'd like to acknowledge some of our former school board members, Graciano Gomez, Jim Marinas, and Dr. Elsa Valdez. And I'd like to also introduce and recognize the Consulate of Guatemala in San Bernardino, Mr. Billy Adolfo Jose Munoz Miranda. I would also like to thank Congressman Pete Aguilar and his assistant, Renee Suspedes, for their support of today's event. At this time, 
I would like to invite to the stage the president of the San Bernardino City Unified School District Board of Education, Mr. Mike Gallo. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, Linda. You got taller. <laughs> I won't stand on this, uh, this uh, step here, might fall off of that. But, you know, I have some bad news and I have some good news. You wanna hear the bad news first? Let's go to the bad news first. You have um, the unfortunate uh, distinction to have me serving another four years uh, on the <laughs> Board of Education from this past election, thank you so much. But there is some good news. Uh, we also re-elected Dr. Margaret Hill, as you heard. <laughs> Margaret. <laughs> and uh, Gwendolyn Rogers, congratulations, our newest appointee to the board and now our newest elected. And then Dr. Scott Wyatt, he's down here. I can't see you, but he's down here as well. Scott's going to be a great addition to the board. And I thank you to the entire Board of Education. A little more bad news. Linda Savage will be leaving us uh, this year as well in December. And Linda, I just want to thank you for your dedicated service for 20 zillion years that you've been doing this. I don't know how you've tolerated uh, uh, this crew that long, but uh, you've been a mentor to us, and I really thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, so let's give Linda round of applause. You know, there's a lot of other good news, and we'll be celebrating that, I'm sure, in some of the uh, discussions here and talks, and as Dr. Marsden gets up and shares some of the highlights of this year as well. But, you know, we've been blessed with unprecedented graduation rate increases. We've been blessed with a drop, historic drop in dropout rates uh, uh, has gone down. It's just uh, uh, such a a blessing to this community because there's economic uh, uh, value in high school diplomas and, uh, and persisting in public education because we really know that is truly the passport to prosperity. And um, I just want to congratulate our entire staff for the dedicated work that uh, I've been proud to be part of this past four years and look forward to continuing in that great service uh, with you all. You know, we uh, as a board have uh, invested in some strategic objectives kind of threefold. They fit in kind of threefold camps. First one is student achievement gains. You know, that's our primary focus to see our students actually achieve, become qualified with the skills, abilities, credentials, certifications necessary to persist in college and or careers effectively. With that challenge, we've had to focus on our organization as well, to big, build an organization of excellence. We have an excellent team and an excellent organization, but we can strive for the best. We're going to be the best education system in this United States. That's where we're going. And all of you are helping us get there. And this community, this fourth annual community and gathering for excellence is something that we started uh, right from the beginning when we first came on the board as something that we knew was important. If we were gonna build an organization of excellence, high expectations, high reliability, and one that's gonna strive to see our students become and do anything that they want, we had to build an organization and a culture of excellence, culture of respect and of value and value our people. And that's the third thing, third area of investment that we've made, and that's in our people. And that's what we're gonna to continue to focus on. To function in an organization of excellence, we gotta build and have the best people. We do now, we gotta invest in those people, in professional development, in things that we're trying to do for student achievements from uh, our career pathway work, which is 
innovative and uh, exciting for kids when you see the third grade kids learning solid works the same stuff my rocket scientists are using in uh, uh, in in technology developments uh, for NASA and the space agencies and United States Air Force and our third graders are learning this same stuff printing things out on 3d printers all the way up through high schools and pathways and engaging all of our students from the arts to digital media to uh, advanced manufacturing precision machining medical technologies GIS technologies and all of the advanced uh, programs that are one day going to provide them with economic opportunity to help rebuild this city and develop the ec develop us economically and see us prosperous once again so that's why we're here. I thank you, each and every one of you, for being here today. I'm looking forward to an exciting morning and look forward to sharing it with you. Thank you. Thank you, President Gallo. We also have some special greetings this morning from our key partners. So please join me as we watch a series of special video messages. Good morning, I'm Margaret Hill, your Board of Education Vice President. I extend my most sincere gratitude to each and every one of you for taking the time to be with us on this important day. Over the past four years, our board and our district have worked very hard to lay the foundation for student achievement. It is because of your valuable input and involvement that we have developed a community engagement plan that ensures every child in our district receives a quality education. Your continued support and engagement are vital as we continue working to make hope happen in our community. Thank you for your support in the past, currently, and the future. You are making every school year a successful one for all our students. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the fourth annual Community Gathering of Excellence for the San Bernardino City Unified School District. My name is Dr. Barbara Flores. I'm one of your school board members and have been since 2008 and proud to be one of your leaders. And I love our school board. We are collaborative. Uh, we work well together. We also work well with Dr. Marsden, our superintendent, and the cabinet, and all the site principals and teachers and we're very happy, as well as our classified uh, employees. Um, three themes that I'd like for us to focus on today, um, be collaboration, leadership, and caring. If we are not all together, uh, parents, students, teachers, administrators, board members, we could not ac accomplish what we've had, we have today. Making hope happen takes all three of these and more. And you should see that we have accomplished a lot, but we still have to go. Today you will find out all the things that we've accomplished and where we need to go. Career pathways, A through G completion, college career readiness, um, et cetera, and of course academic achievement. And we want to look at all of our kids, not just the top kids, and we want to create a culture of making hope happen and of collaboration, true leadership, and also true caring. Y quiero decirles a los padres en español que los apreciamos mucho, nuestra comunidad, y queremos trabajar juntos y, y sigamos con la meta de, de hacer realidad nuestras esperanzas. Muchas gracias. Good morning, everyone. Buenos días a todos. I am your school board member, Abigail Medina. Welcome to our fourth annual Community Gathering for Excellence. As you know, it takes a village to raise a child. I'm glad you've accepted our invitation to be part of our village, a village that is working very hard to make hope happen for the children of this community. For the past two years, I have dedicated my life to public service because like you, I want to improve the quality of life for this community. I believe firmly that creating economic dignity and prosperity begins in our schools. Our schools are the very first places where children first dream about becoming doctors, entrepreneurs, and astronauts. Please join us as we continue working to turn childhood dreams into reality. Thank you, and muchas gracias. 
Hello, I am Gwen Rogers, a lifelong San Bernardino resident and your appointed Board of Education representative. I am proud of all the mothers, fathers, and guardians and stakeholders who are here at our Community Gathering for Excellence. By partnering with our wonderful teachers and our school district, you are contributing to the academic success of your students. Through engaging events like this one, we are working diligently to create welcoming school environments that result in more of you getting involved. Engaged stakeholders bring about engaged students, and that is a perfect recipe for academic success. Thank you again for being a part of our winning team. Good morning, I'm Linda Savage, and for the past 26 years, I have had the joy of serving on our Board of Education. During that time, we have accomplished more for the children of this community than I ever dreamed was possible. As I prepare to retire from the board, I do so with the satisfaction of knowing that we have put systems in place to ensure that every child graduates from high school prepared to succeed in college or the workforce. I urge you to remain active in our schools and commit yourselves to making hope happen for each one of our 50,000 students. Your reward, like mine, will be seeing our next generation of lawyers, teachers, doctors, and public servants take on the world. Thank you again for entrusting me with the education of your children. As a school board member, I am very happy that our district brought so many teachers, staff, parents, students, and community members together for a common cause. As you begin charting our path, I hope you will consider that this school district and this community must prepare students to succeed in a world evolving more rapidly than ever before. I see those rapid changes in my job as a Departmental Information Systems Administrator for San Bernardino County Human Services. I know it will take every one of us working as a team to achieve the ambitious goals we're about to set. But I'm certain of one thing, this group recognizes that the stakes are high. Within our reach is the potential to transform our schools, our neighborhoods, our cities, and our nation. Like you, I will not settle for anything short of accomplishing this shared vision. Thank you very much for your time and effort. Congratulations to the San Bernardino City Unified School District Board of Education, Superintendent Dale Marsden, and the staff, students, and families of the San Bernardino District as you celebrate your 2015 Community Gathering of Excellence. This is an exciting time for your district and our county as a whole. Never have our hopes and dreams for the students and families of this county been so closely aligned as we march forward with common vision and purpose. Together, we have all embraced a countywide vision and regional goal to support the success of every child from cradle to career. Your district's community engagement plan is receiving wide recognition for its community and staff inclusiveness and its focus on student success and stakeholder engagement. We are extremely excited that this work aligns with County Schools' strategic plan and that together we are working to see that more of our students are reading at grade level, that more of our parents are engaged in our schools and their children's education, that more of our students are graduating high school prepared for college and careers, and even more of our students are attending our colleges and universities. It's evident when good people come together sharing a common vision for the common good, that's when great things happen. Thanks for what you do to make hope happen. Thank you for coming to the fourth annual Community Gathering for Excellence. As president, it is my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of San Bernardino Valley College, a close partner to San Bernardino City Unified Schools, and one of the most established institutions of higher education in our region. Thank you for continuing the tradition of excellence established by your predecessors and even exceeding your own accomplishments year after year. Thank you teachers, thank you school administrators, and thank you parents for putting in the time and effort necessary to make the future leaders of our country the best of the best. We sincerely appreciate everything you do to make our community better. Though the task may seem monumental at times, 
That's because it truly is. You are a monument to the vitality of our local community. Thank you for all you do. My name is Dick Hart, president of Loma Linda University Health. And it is a privilege this morning to partner with you in this community gathering for excellence here in San Bernardino. We are building a new San Bernardino campus located between G Street and the freeway that will house our new San Manuel Gateway College, where we expect to train young people with job entry skills to care for their families and provide health care to the region. Our SAC Health system, also located in this new San Bernardino campus, will provide both primary and specialty care to the citizens of this area. It's a privilege for Loma Linda to be part of San Bernardino and to make this endeavor come true. Our motto is to make man whole, and we look forward to partnering with you in the great days ahead. Good morning. I want to offer my personal welcome to all of you for this year's Community Gathering for Excellence. I would also like to offer my thanks to Superintendent Dale Marsden and his amazing staff for once again putting together a marvelous program that focuses on enhancing and improving the education of our young people, but also in creating a vehicle where we can all work together to benefit our communities now and in the future. Later on today, you will hear from my colleagues and myself on each of our institution's strategic plan for the future. Despite the differences in our institutions, be they educational, government, or civic, they all share a common goal, to improve the lives of the people in our communities and create meaningful and successful education and job opportunities for our young people and for generations to come. Thanks again for attending, and I hope you enjoy the conference. Good morning. It's an honor to be able to help welcome all of you to this meeting today. We in education are privileged in that we get to spend every day thinking about the future. The future in particular as it's seen through the eyes of all those students in our classrooms. Each of those students has a future that's in part in our hands. From preschool to kindergarten to grade school to middle school to high school and on through higher education. We have a responsibility for ensuring that the transitions those students face and the successes and the tribulations they face are managed in a way that's going to make them the very best citizens of the future. And we can only do that, I believe, if we come together at times like this and think collectively about what we're doing today to make sure that future really is a bright one. I want to thank Superintendent Marsden for making this occasion possible and of course all the people at the district. They've shown the way, improving their graduation rates as they have in the last few years, that putting an effort forward and working collectively can make a difference. And I'm personally excited to be part of the conversations today to make sure that we continue to improve our systems around the region to make sure that all of our students have a successful future. Hello, I'm Assemblymember Cheryl Brown of the 47th Assembly District. It's an honor to be here with you today for the fourth annual Community Gathering of Excellence. As a product of the local schools, I'm excited to see our community come together and ensure the success of future leaders. This past year, I worked with my colleagues to increase funding for education at all levels. We added seven point six billion dollars on top of the six point one billion from last year for funding for schools. We've added one billion dollars for career technical education. We've provided seven point nine billion for community colleges. Now that's seven hundred million dollars more than last year. I'm proud of the work that our school board is doing, that our parents, our administrators, our community leaders and stakeholders have done to bring our community together. Thank you once again for attending and I look forward to our continued work together. Thank you for inviting the county to participate in this amazing event. Five years ago we set out to identify the vision our residents and investors have for the future of our county. We conducted a robust community engagement effort. What we found is that our people envisioned a complete county where all elements of the community work together to create prosperity and well-being. 
The elements of our community are interrelated and interdependent. For our community to succeed, schools, our economy, health care, public safety, and the other elements of our community must all succeed. That's why collaboration is necessary for us to achieve our vision. The county is carrying through on our promise to convene the key leaders of these elements to set and achieve goals toward achieving the vision. Through the vision, for the first time in our county's history, schools are working with employers, public safety, the healthcare community, and others to create the complete county our residents want. The county is proud to align itself with the San Bernardino City Unified School District and our other community partners as we work to achieve our shared vision. Thank you. Well, I'm happy to have been invited to the San Bernardino City Unified School District's Community Gathering for Excellence. This is an opportunity for those partners to come together and to let the community know what's taking place in San Bernardino. As you may recall, back in February, the city, in collaboration with the school district, we put together five community forums. At those five community forums, we were able to take a pulse of the community and find out what the priorities were of our citizens. As a result of those five community meetings, we then put together, together with the city council, a team of 17 strategic planning members that helped us to take those major priorities that were discovered through the forums and incorporate them into our plan of adjustment recovery plan. I'm proud to be a part and associated with this effort at this time. So together with the school district, the city has been very supportive of all of those efforts and we're grateful for the opportunity to be able to collaborate at this time and we look forward to much achievement in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, those messages prove that this truly is a community that is gathered together for excellence as in, and is committed completely to moving our community forward. Let's give all of those leaders a big round of applause. I'd like to make a few housekeeping announcements. First of all, ladies and gentlemen, the refreshments are in the back of the room. And then to my right over here, we have restroom facilities. There are additional restroom facilities located out the doors on my left. We also have a table where we are selling the book, Making Hope Happen. As you know, our keynote speaker is Dr. Shane Lopez. He will be joining us shortly. And we are also recruiting some of you members who have never been in a school before to serve as a principal for a day. So if you get an opportunity and your heart is touched by the work of our students and the work of our community leaders, please feel free to join us and serve as a principal for a day on March 4th. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Join me in welcoming to the podium the man who is leading the charge to make hope happen in our community, our superintendent of the San Bernardino City Unified School District, Dr. Dale Marsden. Thank you, Linda, and want to welcome everyone to our fourth annual Community Gathering for Excellence. But before I get started, I just want to thank uh, our San Bernardino High School uh, Junior ROTC. They were fantastic. And as a former veteran myself, I was pleased. I don't know if you noticed, but it was four young ladies. And in a time in our military uh, when we have, uh, you know, uh, more and more women joining, it's such a pleasure to see these young ladies as leaders uh, growing into that, uh, that readiness. Also want to thank our teen music workshop. Not only did they do a fantastic job at the opening, but a flawless national anthem. I mean, give it up again. These guys did very well. And Victory, Ali, who you heard from earlier, uh, Victory, your comments were so heartfelt, and I thank you for those. And you, uh, no doubt, will be a fantastic leader to serve our community, and you represent it very well, so thank you. And Linda and her team and everyone for coordinating and putting all together. It's just always a fantastic event that goes flawless. 
You know, as I start, I just want to mention, uh, if you paid attention to the LA Times recently, uh, you've read a continuance of a series of articles that paints a, a disturbing picture of the city of San Bernardino as a broken city. And the question uh, is really not the, the content of the articles, but rather our response. Uh, do these articles disturb us to a point of discouragement or do these articles disturb us to a point where we are now more determined than ever to keep at this work regarding our city uh, and rebuilding our city brick by brick, person by person, until our community is a place where all people thrive? That's the question we are wrestle with, and I'll tell you what I suggest we opt for the latter. Uh, for those of you who are new to this gathering, I want to kind of give you a sense of where the idea came from. Uh, and we had started, as you heard from President uh, Gallo a little earlier, uh, with our strategic plan. And then that grew into a community engagement plan. Uh, and the way that we operated was following guidance from a gentleman named Dick Axelrod, who wrote a book called Terms of Engagement. He said, you know, if you want to accelerate change, you have to involve more people in the process than thought practicably possible. So when you look around today, today is not practical, perhaps, but I will tell you it has helped us to take our change to scale much more quickly. And I'll speak to some of those results uh, shortly. And then as that uh, progressed, you know, the first year of our gathering, I spoke as the new superintendent of schools. The second year we had a guest speaker was uh, Dr. Carl Cohen. And some of you who were there may recall, Dr. Carl Cohen was the former superintendent of Long Beach Unified School District. And he gave a story or a message that back in the 90s, Long Beach was what San Bernardino is today. And he talked about making hope happen takes time, takes concerted efforts and energies, and you have to sustain that journey as time goes on. It's not just one year, or two, or three, or four. This is a, a long-term journey. It's a journey I believe within one decade we can turn our city around as we just continue to press at it, not be distracted, and keep focused on our vision for excellence. In the third year, you heard uh, last year from Dr. Dick Hart, president of Loma Linda University Medical Center, and you know, he talked about how the university is reaching its hands into this city and really helping us to take what is a city uh, that may some may call broken uh, and who better to cause some healing uh, than the heart and head of, uh, of uh, Loma Linda University. And with their Vision 2020 campaign for a whole tomorrow, and as uh, you heard in the video from Dick Hart, making man whole, every man, every woman, every child, whole is their mission. Uh, they've begun to do that. And with the formulation, as you look across the street from the 66er Stadium and you see the Gateway College, knowing that our graduated seniors uh, have the opportunity to go right into a program with low cost, high quality certifications and advanced health career fields is a fantastic opportunity. And not only that, but every one of our high schools is now working on a plan to have a health career pathway uh, evident through all those. Why not have our young people be the ones who take the market share of available uh, medical positions? It's something that's much needed. So to date, as a result of our work together over the last three years and, and now entering into our fourth, we're at three years and four months, uh, San Bernardino City has seen some pretty remarkable results. You heard President Gallo mention our graduation rates uh, for 2013-14 exceeded the countywide average. That was the first time that occurred since the 1970s and less than one a point away from the statewide average. That's fantastic for a city where over 91% of our students uh, come from homes classified as poverty with free and reduced lunch, where we have a crime index of a four out of 100, uh, where we have 54.3% of our population on some sort of public assistance. You would think, how can you get those kinds of outcomes? It's because of the fantastic work of these collective impact efforts that occur among us. Our African-American students saw an incredible increase at 8.4% growth for that graduation rate. Our Latino students surpassed the state graduation rate over 80%. Middle College High School, not too far from here, and neighbors are Valley College with a 100% graduation rate. And three of our other, you can give a hand for that. 
and three of our other high schools well over a 90% graduation rate. We also had an over 50% reduction in the number of citations given to students, a 23% reduction this past year in suspensions with a 58% reduction in what are called K violations. So uh, kids are no longer uh, suspended at the rates that they were previously trying to keep kids in school and help them become successful. Because of our work with our African American Task Force on Student Achievement, our county superintendent of schools reached out to us and I was present uh, when our work in this task force with so many other community leaders was presented to leaders throughout our county in the San Bernardino County Superintendent of Schools Office. And now today, there are many districts participating in what we call instructional rounds, going out to identify not what's broken in their schools for African American students, but what's working well among us and building on what's working well to ensure the success of all students. And time fails me to go into detail about having uh, our county's only national blue ribbon school in Hillside Elementary Dem University Demonstration School. They received that award this past year and we traveled to Washington, D.C. to receive that. Fantastic. We're the only school uh, locally to receive the National Turnaround Arts Grant uh, with Barton Elementary School. Again, we were invited to the White House by Michelle Obama to receive that award. It was a fantastic <laughs> opportunity. First ever uh, talent show in the White House, so that was pretty cool to get a chance to be a part of that event. And then most recently, and I want to announce a brand new award, just last week I flew back and I'm so grateful Ted Alejandro, our county superintendent of schools, joined me. We were invited by the college board when we found uh, that during their national conference this past week, we were recognized, they recognized San Bernardino City Unified School District as the only large urban school district to receive the Gaston Caperton Opportunity Award for growth and the number of traditionally underserved students who are ready for college. And I want you to see a video that was played at this national conference to give you a taste of what this award means to us and our community. There's challenges that many students go through before they even get here in the morning. They're battling dragons. There are lots of big dreams for doing things, but the steps to the goals, that's where the challenge begins. Although a lot of us come from bad backgrounds, we want better for ourselves. Obstacles are everywhere, and it takes amazing schools to create the opportunity to excel. Today, we celebrate four high schools for creating opportunities to underrepresented and underserved students with the Gaston Caperton Opportunity Award. This award honors high schools that expand access to higher education through academic offerings and innovative college preparation programs. The Gaston Caperton Award tells me what we're doing here is good. The teachers here are fantastic. To have a national recognition just means that somebody else saw it too. It makes me feel like they really value our education and the education they're providing us. Today, we honor these exceptional schools. Arroyo Valley High School, Lake City High School, Coeur d'Alene High School, and Broome High School. All students deserve the hope to succeed. The Gaston Caperton Opportunity Award honors schools that are making good on their commitments to deliver that opportunity every day. To the teachers that have helped me, they seen me struggled and they see me grow up and it was because of them. Thank you. <laughs> and as you saw in the video, though it's a district award, they asked to select one of our high schools to showcase. So all the students you saw pictured there, all the video was taken at our own Arroyo Valley High School and later in January, February, they'll have the official announcement where all the media descends on the campus uh, to recognize, and that comes with a monetary award as well. But again, we were the only large urban in the nation recognized with this award serving students. And this is a direct outcome because of the kinds of partnerships that exist in and among us. And think today we're gonna build just on that. So we're by no means uh, done. We have uh, yet a great deal of work to do. Uh, but this work cannot be done without leadership. Leadership from the boardroom uh, to the classroom and across this entire city and our county and beyond to our state. 
regional partnerships. You know, Jim Clifton, the CEO of Gallup, and I've mentioned him before to our community, wrote a book called The Coming Jobs War, and he talks about this, that you know, our dropout crisis, our, our issues that our community faces are not just a school district issue alone, they are an entire community crisis, and they can't be solved alone. They have to be solved uh, with these kinds of partnerships as they play themselves out. Um, you know, and so it takes that kind of tribal leadership. Recently, our city's mayor, Kerry Davis, invited us to partner with the city during their strategic planning efforts, not to just get out of bankruptcy, but how could we collectively plan to have a city of excellence? And when we talk about a school district, uh, of excellence, what we're talking about is not just closing the gap between one group and another group, we're talking about what are the highest levels of excellence that students can possibly achieve, like all students being ready for college, all students being ready for career. That's a level of excellence. You know, sometimes people press back a little bit on that and say, well, does every kid need to call, go to college? You know, and I'd ask you the same question and I'll I'll bet you'd answer that like I do is if you're in this room, and I won't have you stand like I did with all my managers and leaders, but if you're in this room and your child currently is going to college or will go to college or has been to college, or if you had a child, they'd be one of those three, and I asked you to stand, I can assure you everybody in this room would stand. So why, I ask, is it okay for our kids, but it's not okay maybe for every kid in our city. And I would suggest we need to shift that conversation. <laughs> college is for every young person, and that will help them be prepared. If we prepare them for college, they're prepared for career. It's one and the same. And so our goal is to break through that ceiling of excellence and ensure our kids have that opportunity for their future. And so as I suggested during the city's planning event, I wanted this event to grow from being less of a school district centric event and now transforming, and you'll see this happen over the next several years, into a gathering that has more of the state of the community address or feel to it, where we begin to align our interdependent plans. You know, each one of the organizations that you saw pictured and the leaders speak today has its own unique strategic plan. Well, there's all these wonderful acts of excellence going on in each of these organizations and within our community. How about taking these random acts of excellence and, and aligning them so there's aligned acts of excellence, and today you'll be able to partake in an activity that will do just that. As well, you'll be able to sign up and give us your name as an expert in some of these areas to help us tap into you uh, so we can further this work and have a collective impact. And you know, I gotta really give credit where credit is due uh, about five years ago to this month, our own uh, county CEO, Greg Devereaux, where's Greg? Greg, can you stand up for just a minute and wave so everybody sees you? Where are you at? Over here, there he is. A very unique to have a county CEO that set out five years ago to take on the task of an entire county-wide vision. And Greg accomplished it. Under his leadership, the city of Ontario went, Ontario went to prosperity, and now the county of San Bernardino, because of his efforts, is going to a level of prosperity that we've not yet seen or realized. And I'm so grateful to have leaders like Greg and so many others in this conversation. I want to thank our, yeah, give him a hand. I want to thank our chairman of the board of supervisors, James Ramos, for being here as well, and today, our countywide vision has throughout it, it always comes back to education. It has within the countywide vision is this cradle to career continuum. It's been now adopted by many boards, including the San Bernardino City Unified School District Board uh, throughout our entire county. And I wanna thank the other leaders in this community who had a significant impact, and I wanna point out a few of those impacts as I go along the way. Cheryl Brown, our assembly member, who, who was mentioned a little while ago and you saw her speech, you may or may not know this, but Cheryl was very instrumental as a legislator, not only in the local control funding formula that happened at the statewide level, but locally just a few years ago. And when I came on to the school district, we found out we had this log jam within our personnel commission where people couldn't get hired. There were literally hundreds upon hundreds of jobs frozen. And because of Cheryl's efforts and working with our, our union leaders at the state level, we were able to free up some, some work that happened through some of our legislators and our state superintendent of public instruction because of her efforts. And we got that personnel commission working. And the reason I mention that is because that act alone raised the employment rate in San Bernardino City by 3%, just that action of her as a leader. And that's significant to mention. 
you know, other leaders who I, I, can't, I can't spend time on all of them, but the Inland Empire Economic Partnership and the leadership of Paul Grinio and how he's pulled together the San Bernardino and Riverside counties to regionally do some work has been a heavy lift and a lot of work. And out of that, uh, Dr. Tomas Morales and Ted Alejandra uh, lead the, the education element through this uh, cradle to career continuum piece. And, you know, it's rare that you hear a university president when he first, Tomas first came on board, he's talking about early edu childhood education education. Uh, he was the author of report on college readiness where he talked about, you know, the, the, the real work of college readiness happens in preschool, happens in, in, in early years development. He, this is his constant message, and he's been working with us to that end. He held uh, forever as the president of the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities. He invited me and Ted Alejandra and, and our, a host of other uh, superintendents came and and we're at the uh, uh, Haku conference, and we were the first time ever presented on this pre-K-12 university partnership. So ours is a showcase for the nation and what, what is gonna work for kids in terms of uh, having that, that kind of effort. Additionally, because of Tomas's leadership, we received together the state's largest ever gear up grant totaling over $10 million that is serving our young people. What that looks like is every one of our eighth graders right now, all of our eighth graders are being followed as a cohort from eighth grade to ninth grade to 10th grade to 11th grade to 12th grade to college in this cohort focused model. So our young people have every opportunity to be highly successful. And we're not holding out, pulling any stops on that. And you know, I gotta mention also a great partner has been Al Carnegie. You know, old, old university presidents uh, never die. Uh, they just get to work on other tasks and the tasks that Al has taken on, and I think he's a, a consummate leader for this, is the work around zero to 36 months. You know, most of our, please, yeah, do give him a hand. Most of uh, the work that we face in public education when kids enter kindergarten, we're always trying to play catch up the amount of time, energy, resources to put into kids after they get to kindergarten is, is insurmountable compared to what's really necessary. There's what we call this 30 million word gap by the time kids get to three years old. And so how do we build a system that supports kids? And he's met with all of our hospital leaders, our university leaders, our college leaders, our school district leaders, our city leaders, and we're now working on launching a plan that will support our young people, uh, future leaders, zero to 36 months uh, shortly. So that's exciting work that's ahead for us. Ted Alejandro, our county superintendent of schools, as I mentioned some work with him earlier, has now got us working with Alignment USA. So talk about collective impact. There's other efforts like this that we're doing in our own city and community across the nation that we can learn from. How do we bring all these partners together to get these collective ideas married and have mutually reinforcing activities that we're all clearly engaged in? So we're learning from the best. Uh, Gloria Fisher from Valley College and Cheryl Marshall, who's also here from Crafton Hills. These are partners that have really helped us and supported our efforts. Cheryl has helped us to, excuse me, Glor Gloria specifically has helped us at Middle College High School now to take where we have concurrent enrollment and young people gathering not just their high school diploma, but also an associates. We're gonna take that to scale now where more and more of our high school kids will have opportunity to do just the same thing. We're excited about that and also excited about uh, Peace Humanity may not have heard that one of our students at San Bernardino High School achieved with their high school diploma also, yes, get this, a bachelor's in Arabic studies uh, because of our partnership with Cal State San Bernardino. So the sky's the limit as we take the, the walls off of what kids are able to do. And our newest partner from UCR, uh, Kim Wilcox, the chancellor, you know, mission they have is to grow local talent together. They have currently served over a thousand of our students through an education talent search uh, and a K-12 mentoring program for future careers in medicine. In San Bernardino, Arrowview and Riley schools, Riley University Prep, uh, have, have uh, received support just in that very effort to take that to scale throughout our district as we get kids elementary, middle to high school ready uh, for future careers. In addition, Cal State University and UCR partnered on a $5 million governor award for innovation in higher ed that will help fund some of these partnership opportunities. Very pleased with that work. Because of the efforts and a host of public and private partnerships, today, San Bernardino City Unified School District is making 
uh, progress toward excellence. We have over 7,176 high school students engaged in career pathways, over 27 career pathways today, ranging from health and biotechnology to education career pathway that, by the way, is a model for our state as it's a round trip ticket. If our kids at a high school level want to become future teachers, which is an impacted area, uh, they can enroll in that academy, which we're growing to more of our high schools. Not only that, when they graduate from high school, if we employ them in any position as a classified employee, we can also pay their tuition to go to college to help finish that round trip ticket to bring kids back to our system as teachers. You see career pathways. Additionally, as you look at our career pathways, you see renewable resources and energy, arts and media, advanced manufacturing, building trades, design, information technologies, hospitality and tourism. And late, the latest one that I'm so pleased with is over at our continuation high school at San Andreas. They've developed a career pathway on geographic information systems in partnership with Esri. Do you know a young person who comes out of that program with a certificate in GIS gets a starting job making $48,000 a year. That's a fantastic opportunity for our young people. And recently, and you'll see the new sign starting to go up, but I want to announce that our adult school has now gone through a rebranding process, and they are now called the Inland Career Education Center taking our adult world of education to a whole new level. You know, we serve about six to 8,000 adults in our community through our adult school that is now called the Inland Career Education Center as we're taking that to scale. These are enormous partnerships and so proud of them. For the last three years, as we've worked with Gallup, we've been using the Gallup student poll and we've been measuring our students' perceptions in three areas, hope, engagement, and well-being. This past year, we had an unprecedented 95% participation rate. That means over 26,000 of our students, fifth through 12th grade, uh, we're still waiting for the results. They come out here pretty close to, uh, to um, uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, but we've learned from Gallup that hope is a better predictor of student future success than academics or test scores. When we can measure that, we learned that by moving the dial, by just 1% on student engagement, that equates to six points in reading achievement and eight points in math achievement. So much more reason why more of our young people, elementary, middle, and high school, need to be involved in career pathways. And then when measuring well-being, we found a kindred heart, uh, Loma Linda University Medical Center, pun intended, uh, when we were the, we're the healthiest city in America is invading our borders. And we're so pleased with that invasion because we know that as we work together in partnership around student well-being, uh, that work will continue to take to scale what's so necessary for our community. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our, our community is making hope happen uh, for the city of San Bernardino. And some time ago, uh, just before his book became available for hard copy purchase, I was able to download and read Dr. Shane Lopez's a book, Making Hope Happen. And as soon as I read it, I said, what's described in here is exactly what's going on in our community. And I, I got on the phone and we hunted down a number to talk to Shane Lopez. And finally, I got to talk to Shane on the phone because he wrote the book, Making Hope Happen. He also wrote all the student polling work on it for Gallup. When I read the book and I talked to him, I said, Shane, everything you've written in here talks about what's going on now in the city of San Bernardino and how we're trying to take what used to be America's greatest city and build it and make it great again. I said, do you mind, could we use the title of your book as our district's motto? And Shane agreed that we could when he heard the story of all of us who've worked together so diligently to move these dials. And from that, uh, we've also established now the Making Hope Happen Foundation. And actually all the proceeds from the sales of today's books will go to the Making Hope Happen Foundation. Uh, our foundation under the leadership of Dr. Sam Gibbs. Why don't you stand up, Sam, where are you? I saw you come in, I don't know where, there he is. He leads that foundation. Uh, we recently had a generous donor who has uh, given to help us with a goal. He will, he will match anybody's contribution to make possible this, this goal for the foundation is to guarantee for this year 
guarantee 100 kids college. 100 kids guaranteed college this year. So if you, if you give to the foundation 100 bucks, it's automatically doubled to two, or you give 1,000, it's doubled to 2,000, or 10,000, double to 20. If you give $100,000, well, we'll talk to them and see if they'll match that too. Um, our keynote speaker today, Dr. Shane Lopez is the author, as I mentioned, of Making Hope Happen. He is the world's leading researcher on hope. His mission is to teach people that investing in their futures pays off today. Dr. Lopez is also one of the most vocal advocates of the psychological reform of America's, edu America's education system. He helps schools function less like impersonal factories and more like dynamic human development centers that enable students to achieve the meaningful futures they say they really want, including a good job and a happy family. Dr. Lopez is a Gallup senior researcher, scientist, and director of the Clifton Strengths Institute. He is chief architect of the Gallup Student Poll, a measure of hope, engagement, and well-being that taps into the hearts and minds of U.S. public school students to determine what drives achievement. It is available at no cost to public schools or districts interested in using it to start a hope conversation in their community. More than one million students have participated since its inception. Dr. Lopez researches the links between hope, strengths development, academic success, and overall well-being, and collaborates with scholars around the world on these issues. He specializes in hope and strengths enhancements for students from preschool through college graduation, advocating a whole school strengths model that also builds the strengths expertise of educators, parents, and youth development organizations. He is co-author of the statistical reports for the Clifton Strengths Finder and the Clifton Youth Strengths Explorer. A prolific author, Dr. Lopez has published more than 100 articles and 10 books. Dr. Lopez is a fellow of the American Psychological Association, a professor of education for a decade. He is now professor of business at the University of Kansas. Please join me in giving a warm San Bernardino welcome to Dr. Shane Lopez. Wow, there are a lot of people out there. Um, I'm gonna tell you a few stories. I'm gonna talk about some research data. Um, I'm gonna talk for about three hours, is that okay? Everybody good with that? All right, um, I wanna tell you this story of AJ. He's one of the most hopeful people I know. And AJ comes to mind because um, he, he just reached out and, and grabbed the attention of one of my bosses and Dale mentioned him, um, Jim Clifton. And Jim walked into his apartment building one day and AJ was sitting in the lobby. And AJ said, hi, sir, how are you? And Jim said, I'm fine, how are you? And they started a nice conversation. And then AJ got to the point pretty quickly. He said, Jim, what do you do for a living? And Jim said, well, I run this, this thing called the Gallup Poll. He, AJ, he said, AJ, have you ever heard of it? He goes, no, I've never heard of the Gallup Poll. And they had a conversation about what the Gallup poll is and what Gallup does. And AJ said, well, I got to tell you, I'm pretty interested in what you do there at the Gallup poll. Are you hiring? And Jim said, well, as a matter of fact, we are. And typically, I don't know if you've ever applied for a job at Gallup, but you have to go online and do a bunch of uh, assessments and then you get an interview and then it's, it's a pretty lengthy process. But I guess when you're the CEO of the organization, you can bypass all that. So Jim said, AJ, why don't you come to my office and we'll talk about you having a job at Gallup. So AJ took down Jim's information, called him a couple of days later, arranged for an appointment, shows up on time, of course, ready for action. And AJ and Jim have a wonderful interview. AJ knows the history of Gallup. By that time, he had done all his requisite Google searching. He knew exactly where Gallup had been, where Gallup was, and where Gallup was going. And Jim was truly impressed by AJ and decided, you know what, AJ, I'm gonna give you a job. I'm gonna give you a job. You're gonna be a junior analyst and you're gonna work here. 
Um, but first, you've got to go finish middle school, high school, and college, and come on back, and then you can have that job. Well, AJ was too eager. He was too eager. He said, what about my time off from school? Can I work at Gallup during my time off from school? And Jim said, sure, you can. So AJ became a junior analyst at Gallup at the age of 11 years old. Yeah. And he's one of the most hopeful people I know. Now, after working for Gallup for about two years, other people in our building in Washington, D.C. got really impressed by A.J. and started recruiting him. So then A.J., being a, a hopeful creature, he came to us and said, guys, you got to pay me more or I'm going to work for these other folks. So we've lost A.J. to another company, but we think we'll get him back upon his, his college graduation some years from now. Um, I want to tell you stories of the most hopeful people I know. I also want to share some data with you because we have some data that I think is critically important to the work that you do here every day. Um, and I want to start with telling you, if I could have the slides now, if I could tell you just a little bit about how I came upon this work. And Kim Wilcox is in the audience. Um, Kim was dean of the uh, College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at the University of Kansas a long time ago. There was a man there by the name of Rick Snyder who decided that hope was the most important thing he could ever study. He dedicated his life to studying hope. And my work has been on the coattails of Rick Snyder. So I just wanted to honor him by, by mentioning his name because he'd be so happy to, to see making hope happen up here in lights. Um, Rick taught me so many things about hope, but one thing I learned by myself, I was an intelligence researcher. And raise your hand if you've ever taken an intelligence test. All right, I don't know why you did, but I'm sure it was painful um, and no, no real fun. But I gave hundreds of intelligence tests a, a month to people all around the world. And I gathered data to figure out how intelligence related to success in life and happiness in life. And I have to tell you that intelligence only accounts for a quarter a quarter of the success you have in life, okay? And it has no relationship whatsoever with happiness and well-being. Zero relationship with happiness and well-being. So I went to Rick and I said, Rick, I'm, I'm doing these studies, I'm getting published, but I'm not changing anybody's life. He said, do you want to become a hope researcher? And I said, I don't know what the hell that is, but I'm all for it. And he took me on and started researching hope and we've been doing this work in his honor. He passed away some years ago, but we've been doing this work now collaboratively and in his honor for over 20 years. So what I'll share with you in 45 minutes or so is everything I know about hope from the last 20 years or so. But if you want to know more, here's where you can go. You can see it on the slide. At, at, you can go to hopemonger.com, and I have a free hope test there. I also have a lot of free exercises that you can do uh, personally, or you can do with your kid around making hope happen in their lives. And also, if you want to tweet about what we're talking about today, I'm at Hope Monger, at Hope Monger, H-O-P-E-M-O-N-G-E-R, at Hope Monger. But let's talk about how hope matters. And I'll tell you another story about hope mattering. Um, there's a woman named, there's a woman named Tara Rye Trent, and she was born in Zimbabwe. Now, based on the research we've done at Gallup, Zimbabwe is the least hopeful country in the world. So she is the most hopeful person in the least hopeful country in the world. And when I met Tara Rai, she was working on a doctorate degree, but I'll come back to that. When she was first uh, um, introduced to a woman named Joe Luck of Heifer International, she was sitting in a, vi a village in Zimbabwe. And Joe Luck asked her this amazing question that I think you should ask everybody you encounter today as part of this Making Hope Happen Day. You should ask them, what are your hopes and dreams? What are your hopes and dreams? And Joe Luck asked Tara Rai Trent this question, what are your hopes and dreams? And Tara Rai was very quick. Now, a little background on Tara Rai. In her village, she wasn't allowed to go to school because she was a girl, and she secretly did her brother's homework 
because she loved to learn. And when she was caught doing her brother's homework, she was beaten by her father for shaming the family. But nevertheless, she continued to do her brother's homework. Now, when Terari was asked, what are your hopes and dreams? Again, sitting in a village in Zimbabwe, she said, I want to go to America, get a high school diploma, get a bachelor's degree, get a master's degree, and get a doctorate. This is a woman who had never met anyone with a doctorate, much less pursued a doctorate in her own life. With the help of Heifer International, she was sent in her village who sold uh, goats and, and cows to pay for her, her voyage. She was sent to America. Now, she was asked to go to a place a lot like Zimbabwe. So they sent her to Oklahoma. She ended up at Oklahoma State University. And there she was succeeding in the classroom, but she was living in squalor. She didn't have enough money to have adequate housing and adequate food. So she was living in a trailer that was irreparable, and she was living hand to mouth in terms of food and borrow, uh, taking food out of bins sometimes behind grocery stores, uh, so cast offs. A man at the Oklahoma State University heard of Terrorized Story, and he didn't call her. He didn't say, Oh, we've got to go to a class where Terrari is right now. His name was Cliff Beers. He drove to Terrari's house and heard, said, I heard you were a great student, and I heard you're going through hard times. He said, my church's Habitat for Humanity will build you a house. We will get you a scholarship, and we will make hope happen in your life. Yeah. So Tara Rye, the most hopeful creature I've ever met, she lives here in California now, she needed the help of Cliff Beers, and he needed to offer intrusive support. This wasn't passive support, and that's what I want you to hear. We have to offer intrusive support to our students. We have to offer intrusive support to the people in our community. We have to go to their homes and make things happen so that their lives can change. So Tara Rye did get her, her master, excuse me, her bachelor's degree at um, Oklahoma State. Now at the time, her husband had taken over the role of beating her from her father. So Cliff also helped um, Tara Rye deport her husband back to Zimbabwe. So they ultimately were separated and divorced and she went on to marry a gentleman at Oklahoma State. They went on to get her master's degree and then just a couple of years ago, Tara Rye Trent became a PhD and now is an AIDS researcher in California. She appeared on this little show, I don't know if you remember it, I think it was called Oprah. She appeared on this show called Oprah and then Oprah became kind of tired of doing her show and she, she wrapped up her show and she was to name her most um, special guest ever, her favorite guest ever. And she named Tara Rye Trent her favorite guest ever. So Tara Rye came back on the show, and there's a whole backstory. Tara Rye didn't want to go back on the show, but she was tricked into going back on the show, and she got back on the show. And fortunately, she did go back on the show because Oprah gave her $1.2 million to start schools for girls in Zimbabwe. And that's... That's another testament to how hopeful people make their own hope and they meet people who accentuate their mission and help them pursue their goals and dreams. Now, right now, what I want you to do is take a few minutes at your table and really just two or three minutes, I want you to turn to the person next to you and I want you to answer this very simple but provocative question that was asked of Tara Rye. What are your hopes and dreams? You've got three minutes, a minute and a half per person. What are your hopes and dreams? Go.
One more minute. Okay. Now what I'm gonna want you to do, see you get talking about your hopes and dreams and you just can't stop. All right, what I want you to do is vote with your feet. What I want you to do is to stand up, to stand up if one of your hopes and dreams was to have a healthy, happy family. Stand up. All right, so a majority of the crowd stood up. Now have a seat, have a seat. I'll get you bouncing up and down quite a bit here for the next 30 minutes. Now I want you to stand up if you said you wanted a, a healthy, happy life, a healthy, happy life, stand up. All right, about half of you. Okay, have a seat. We've asked this question, what are your hopes and dreams of kids and adults around the world? And here are the answers to, to that question, the three most common answers. People want a good job, a good job. So Dale mentioned Jim Clifton's book, The Coming Jobs War. In the book, he argues that what a, a, the world wants most is a good job. You want a happy family. You also want that family to be somewhat close by. You want them to be somewhat close by. And you want a great life, a good job, a happy family, and a great life. To what extent, to what extent do the 50,000 students in your district have the, the, the permission to pursue these hopes and dreams? To what extent do the teachers in the classrooms know the hopes and dreams of every student? To what extent do we use these as the true carrots to pull students forward, to, to create this, this drive that pulls students forward, the future that pulls students forward? That's the thing I really want you to think about. Because as much and as good as, as much as you're doing in the district and as good as you're doing it, as well as you're doing it, not a kid wakes up in the morning and says, today I'm gonna raise the reading scores for my district. <laughs> it just doesn't happen that way. It doesn't happen that way. Now I'm gonna ask you a weird question. Raise your hand if you've ever rented a car. Okay, most of you've rented a car. Now, stand up if you've ever washed a rental car. I knew it, I knew it, there we go. There's always about one in a hundred people that wash a rental car, but tell me, why don't you wash, you didn't stand up, why don't you wash a rental car? It's not mine. It's not mine. So I'm gonna ask you kind of an odd question. How often do we ask kids to wash rental cars? How often do we ask them to work on goals that are not theirs? How often do we ask them to work on goals that we haven't sold them on just yet? These kids that we're working with today, this Generation Z, Generation Z 
They want a good job, a happy family, and a great life, just like we do. A good job, a happy family, and a great life. Now, let me talk a little bit about data because as a researcher, I get excited about it. So I'm going to bore you with talk of data for the next five minutes, okay? What we have studied at Gallup through the Gallup student poll is the extent to which students are hopeful in America. The extent to which they're pursuing the goals that matter to them most. What we found, and this data is based on the national sample, and, and Dale, you mentioned that we've surveyed over a million people. It's now over three million students we've surveyed in the last five or six years. And this data suggests to us that, well, I'm, I'm going to let you guess. How many, how many, what percentage of students in America are hopeful? Just throw out a number. What percentage of students in America are hopeful? Go ahead. 65, no. 55, no. 35, no. 50, are you saying 50? 75, five, five percent, no. It's 50%. Half the students in America are hopeful, half are not. 33% of students are in a category called stuck. They just don't know which way to go towards hopeful or discouraged. And 17% of students are discouraged. This is a national finding, but it's true in almost every district that about half the students in a district are hopeful, half are not. So we have these six or so, six or more questions um, that get at what hope is. The first one is I know I will graduate from high school. I know I will graduate from high school. Over 80% of students say they will graduate from high school. Now, nationally, that number, 80%, is higher than the national graduation rate. Well, one thing we've learned through the OECD PISA exam is that we may not be number one in math, science, or reading, but our kids are number one in confidence. So they have an extreme confidence that good things will happen in their lives. Our students are not short on will. I know I will find a good job when I graduate. 58% said a strong yes to that item. I energetically pursue my goals. Only 42% said yes to that item. On that item, the yes response goes down for each passing year in school. So a fifth grader is much more likely to say yes to that item than is a 10th or 11th grader. So our students are experiencing less energy with each passing year in school. I can think of many ways to get good grades. Only about half of students said yes to that item. I can find lots of ways around any problem. 37% or 31% said yes to that item. I'm having a hard time reading the screen. Sorry about that. There is an adult in my life who cares about my future. I was heartened by this response. 87% of American students said yes to that item, 87%. Now this next item kind of throws me off a little bit. I have at least one teacher that makes me excited about the future. I have at least one teacher that makes me excited about the future. Raise your hand if you think every child in America should say yes to that item. Yeah, 59% said yes to that item. The kids that were most likely to say yes to that item were the kids in fifth and sixth grade, most of whom have only one or two teachers a day. The kids least likely to say yes to that item are kids in 12th grade who have seven, eight, nine teachers a day. So the more teachers you have, the less likely you are to say you have one that makes you excited about the future. There are a couple of things I want you to pull from this data. One is that our kids desperately want to be known. They want to be known. They want their teachers to know their names, and they want their teachers to make them excited about the future. Two, our kids have the will to get things done, but they don't know the ways. They don't know the ways to get those things done. We have to cobble together the ways. We have to teach them ways to get good grades, and we have to teach them ways to solve problems. Those are the two things our kids lack the most. So you've heard the saying, where there's a will, there's a way. That's true. 
But where there's ways, there's also will. So we need to teach kids how to get problem solving, make problem solving a part of daily life, and get from point A to point B every day in life, whether they're trying to get good grades or trying to figure out how to go to college. Now in this next slide, I'm gonna summarize all the research we've done in the last 25 years on hope and academic outcomes. I could tell you about each of the 50 studies that we did. Raise your hand if you want me to tell you about each of the 50 studies. No, okay, so I'll summarize it all in one slide. What we looked at, we looked at hope and academic outcomes of all types. And what we found, and this is a takeaway point, so if you fell asleep a few minutes ago, wake up for this one. Hope is worth a letter grade. Hope is worth a letter grade. When it comes to academic success, we found that hope accounts for 12% of the variance in academic outcomes. So it's the difference between an A and a B, a B and a C and a C and a D. So half of this audience is hopeful for sake of example, and half of this audience is not hopeful, just like in American schools. You all will do a letter grade better than these folks just because you're more hopeful, just because you're more hopeful. Now I wanna point out a few things. I told you I was an intelligence researcher, so one thing I was curious about is hope related to intelligence? No. It has a zero relationship with all forms of intelligence. Now here's a, here's a tougher question. Is hope related to income? Do you think hope is related to family income? No. Hope is an equal opportunity resource. It's one that we can all possess and it's one that we can share with others. Now let me tell you why these hopeful students are more successful in school than less hopeful students. Number one is that they're excited about the future. And when you're excited about the future, you have more goals. And when you have more goals, you're pursuing your future in a, in a passionate way. And when you're pursuing your future in a passionate way, you're more likely to get from point A to point B in your life. The second thing that you need to know is hopeful students go to school. Hopeful students go to school. In some districts in America, Thursdays and Fridays seem like optional days for high schoolers, all right? The, the, the tendency to skip school on a Thursday or Friday is great. So we worked with one school district and we went to their high school where they had the biggest, the biggest problem with, with, um, with attendance. And we said, okay, what have you tried? And they, they had tried all kinds of things. They had tried incentives. So if you show up for school, you get a snack. They had tried bigger incentives. If you show up for school so many weeks in a row, you get a bigger snack, or you get some kind of, um, you get some kind of technology device. And they, all, they went all the way up to paying students to come to school. None of that worked. What we did is we did a, a really easy hope intervention. We gave StrengthsFinder to each of the students in the school in the ninth grade, and then we had them meet with a strengths coach for 15 minutes and talk about what they do best for just 15 minutes. We raised hope in those students, and guess what? They were more likely to come to school. So high hope students go to school. You don't have to pay them, you don't have to incentivize them, you just have to make them more hopeful and they will show up. Hopeful students are engaged. Dale and other speakers talked about community engagement, parent engagement. Well, student engagement is a critical factor as well. And we know about 60% of American students are engaged. But here's what we know based on hope. If you're hopeful, you're way more likely to be engaged in school. In fact, of the students that are hopeful in our sample of 850,000 students from last year, we found that 75% of them were engaged. 75% of them were engaged. So high hope students are also way more likely to be involved in and enthusiastic about school. Hopeful students are happy. There's some great research, I'm gonna give uh, UC Riverside a plug. There's uh, some great research done by Sonia Lyabmursky of UC Riverside, right here in your own backyard, that demonstrates that happiness leads to success. Happiness leads to success. So what we know is that hopeful students are happy and happy students are successful. 
So we want those students to have hopeful, happy lives. And that is the case based on what we found in our Gallup student poll. The last one I want to accompany a story, I want to add a story to, um, hopeful students are resilient. Um, I had the pleasure of getting to know this wonderful babysitter of ours. Her name is Rose Naughton. And she came into our lives when she was quite young. And then as she got older, she would help around the house. And then as when we started our family, she would come over and babysit our, our son. And Rose was a legend in our community um, because at the age of five, the age of five, she had a heart transplant. Five years old, she had a heart transplant. And she recovered nicely and became this healthy, vibrant young, young kid. And you really, except for this scar, you couldn't tell that she was any different from the other kids. But at the age of 13, so she started babysitting for us when she was about 11 or 12. At the age of 13, she was walking up a hill in Lawrence, Kansas, where I live, and was out of breath. And for the first time in her, her tween age life, she realized that her heart was giving her problems, her new heart. So she had to go to the doctors and she discovered that she needed another heart, another heart. And I tell you this story because Rose is one of the most hopeful people I've ever met. And what she was able to do that second time around as a teenager was pretty miraculous. She, she got the second heart, so now she's on her third heart. But at that point, she said, I'm responsible for my health care at 13 years of age. So she started taking her medicine without the prompting of her parents. And she started going to her appointments with her parents, but she took responsibility for her own health care. So when I interviewed her for this book, Making Hope Happen, I said, Rose, about how many doses of medicine have you taken over the course of your life? She said about 20,000. 20,000 doses of medicine to keep her healthy. I said, okay, you were a teenager for part of this time. You were reckless. You were doing goofy things. How many times have you missed your medication? Two times. Two times out of 20,000. What hopeful people do is they aim their lives at the future. And that's what Rose did. She aimed her life at the future. She wanted to study linguistics at the local university. She wanted to get a boyfriend. She wanted to get married. And she wanted to have a house with a white picket fence. That was her beautiful life. That was her vision of a happy family and a great life. And because of that, and I asked her, I said, Rose, how is it that you take your medicine every day on time? How is it that you stay healthy? And she said, it's because of that vision, that vision of the great life, that vision of a happy family. It pulls me forward. And I behave in my best interest today because of what I want tomorrow. And that's what I want you to really focus on, guys. The future pulls you forward. And we'll come back to that. But investing in the future pays off today. So we know this, this whole idea of compound interest when it comes to our money. If we invest today, it pays off tomorrow. But our psychology works a little bit different. If we invest in the future and we think big, bold thoughts about the future, we actually start behaving in our best interests today. We behave in our best interests today. Now let's talk a little bit about the hopeful workers throughout San Bernardino. And that's where this slide comes in. There is a 14% bump in productivity in the workplace for hopeful employees, a 14% bump. So what we found by studying, um, we studied factory workers, we studied teachers, we studied uh, fast food workers, we studied managers, we studied all kinds of people. What we learned is that the extent to which you're hopeful determines the extent to which you're productive. And it equates to a whole day's worth of productivity out of a seven-day work week. So the extent to which you're hopeful determines how productive you are each and every week. So as you make hope happen in the school system, hopefully you're making hope happen throughout the community because you're going to lead to more and more productivity. Now let's talk a little bit about hopeful students and that next step they go to college. And Dale wants all students to be 
college ready and, and ready for career as well. We just finished a study doing a, looking at a longitudinal sample, and we studied these college freshmen, and we followed them for six years, and we wanted to know what determines success in college. What determines success in college? So we studied the things that most people think determine success in college. High school GPA, okay? SAT and ACT scores. And then we added hope, self-efficacy, and engagement. We studied all of those things over the, over the six-year span. What we found is that high school GPA and ACT scores are important to get you into college and to make you successful during your first year in college. And then those scores become relatively meaningless thereafter. What we found is that someone's hope carried them to four-year graduation and overall success in college. So I don't think this is ever gonna happen, but I have this dream um, sometimes at night that schools will start requiring ACT, SAT, high school GPA, and hope scores to, to get people into college. And you guys could be one of the first, first districts in America to supply those hope scores and say, you need to know how hopeful our students are as well. Now let's talk a little bit about how we make hope happen. This is something that we've been working on throughout America, really trying to figure out how to, to make sure that we can take those 50% of students that are stuck or discouraged and move them into the hopeful ranks. Now I have to mention, and you can email me, I'll give you my personal email. You can email me at shane at strengths.org, shane at strengths.org, and I'll send you a hope scale. I'll send you um, a 90 minute hope intervention that you can use with high school and college students. And I'll send you anything else that I have on my desktop that you might be interested in. So shane at strengths.org. But what we found is that it takes a small amount of time to make a big bump in hope, a small amount of time to make a big bump in hope. And one thing that we've done, and you, Dale mentioned preschool work, we have worked with the uh, Omaha Children's Museum to help young kids take hope for a test drive, take the future for a test drive. So imagine this old uh, Wurlitzer looking um, jukebox type of machine, and we put a camera in the center of it. And these kids, ages three to eight, walk up to the machine and they take a picture of themselves. And then they crop it and make it look all handsome and cute. And then we ask them to adorn that picture with the clothes of the person they want to be when they grow up. And they're able to adorn themselves with multiple layers of clothes. So you can be a physician scientist. You can be a journalist um, scientist. You can be a president uh, chef. You can do all these different types of things. And then you can push that photograph to your parents with the help of their emails. And you can have that as a point of discussion after you leave the Omaha Children's Museum. We've done that. We've, we've also taken kids through this process of writing a letter to your future self. If you go to futureme.org, we've used futureme.org as a portal to the future, as a time machine, if you will. And we have kids write letters to their future selves and deliver those letters six months from, from that point. And you can write anything you want in these letters, but what we try to do is get students to challenge themselves to think about who they want to be in the future and what they want to do to get from point A to point B. Now, I have to tell you, the groups that are easiest to work with are elementary and middle school students when it comes to writing a letter to your future selves. What we found is that high school students have a hard time writing these letters to their future selves, and this is what they tell us, no one's ever asked me to think about the future. No one's ever asked me to think about the future. So we've got to change that. We've got to make sure that we're asking kids to think about the future in really complex ways. If I could have the slides again, please. Um, the next thing is enter the aging booth. Kids love this exercise, and I promise you, you will not love it. Here's what you do. You download an aging app on your phone. Everybody with me? This is easy to do. 
You then take a picture of yourself and then you age yourself 30 years. Who's willing to do that and show us the picture? There you <laughs> Kids love this exercise. Now, I have to tell you, this is rooted in behavioral science and social science. What we've discovered is that when you meet your future self, you're more inclined to behave in your best interest today. So let me tell you a little bit about this research. So what this one researcher did is they had students come in and they had them um, take a picture of themselves but not age it. And then at the end of that brief interaction, they said, oh, by the way, I have one more question for you. If I were to give you $1,000 today, how much would you save for your future? How much would you save for your future? And these guys gave a small amount and relatively small amount of money that they would save for their future. They then invited another group of students to the lab and they asked them to take a picture of themselves and then age it 30 years. And then they were asked the same question. If I were to give you $1,000 today, how much would you save for your future? And with that simple intervention, these guys would save two times the amount of money than these guys would save. Two times the amount of money. So when we get to when we get people thinking about their future selves, they really engage in this complex way of thinking about what they need to do to ready themselves for those hopes and dreams that they've set for themselves. Now finally, spend time with an older adult. I hope you have just fantastic mentoring programs here in the district. The heart and soul of a great mentoring program is the chance to sit with someone who is the future you your future self. Meeting your future self allows you to ask questions of a person that's been through the ups and downs of life and get the answers that you need to take you from where you are today to where you wanna be. So those are some of the strategies we use with kids, but the one I'm most excited about, like I said, I'll email you, um, it's the 90-minute hope intervention that can take kids from low hope to high hope in just an hour and a half but let's talk a little bit about what you can do. I need you to lead with hope. Now, I'm gonna give you another Gallup poll question first, though, okay? It's actually a two-parter. I want you to think about the most influential leader you've ever had in your life. Think about that person and take a mental snapshot of that person, the most influential leader you've ever had in your life. Now, what did that person give you to make your life better? What did that person give you to make your life better? Think of about three things that they gave you to make your life better. Now we're gonna do the table share once again. Turn to your partner and share out who is your influential leader and what are the three things that they gave you to make your life better. You have about three minutes, go ahead.
One more minute. Okay. Gallup asked this question of 10,000 people. 10,000 people. So we asked, who is your most influential leader? And then we asked, what did that person give you to make your life better? We asked them to name three things, just like we did with you. Okay? Here are the four followers' needs. So these are the needs. So we got 30,000 responses. And what we did, I don't know if you've ever been called by Gallup, but sometimes you get these open-ended questions, and then people need to code those questions. So imagine 10,000 responses had to be coded. So what we do is we lock a group about this size in a room with a few cans of Red Bull each, and then we say, go ahead and code. Um, so they did exactly that. And they came out of the room a few days later with four words. They said, these are the followers needs, hope, stability, trust, compassion. The four followers needs again, hope, stability, trust, and compassion. We've talked about hope. Hope is the belief that the future will be better than the present combined with some belief that you have the power to make it so. That's what hope is. The belief that the future will be better than the present combined with some belief that you have the power to make it so. Stability is that you're, you're the same at time one as you are in time two. You're the same to person A as you are to person B. Trust is the emotional side of stability. And it is something that we can't operate without when it comes to leadership and followership. And finally, compassion. And I have to tell you, we kind of we hedged a little bit on compassion. The real word, word that came out of the coding group was love. So from our followers, we get love. Now we did the same study with teachers. We did the same study with teachers, meaning we asked people, name your most influential teacher ever. And what were the three things that they gave you to make your life better? And the answers were caring, hope, and high standards. Caring, hope, and high standards. Hope is a follower's need. It's one of the basic things that your students need. It's one of the basic things that you need. Now, how do we lead with hope? Well, we have one thing that plays to our advantage. And that's the fact that hope is contagious. So hope is contagious. And it moves to the third degree. So at this table, if you're a hopeful creature, then you pass hope on to the next person. And that person passes hope on to the next person. And that person passes hope on to the next person. And you don't know the fourth person. Your hope can be spread to the third degree. Now think about that related to today. I'm going to say we have 900 people here. If we leave here today, you will influence the hope, each of you, of at least three other people directly or indirectly. But then they go off and influence the hope of three people each, directly and indirectly. And then they go off and influence the hope of three people each. So Dale, I love this gathering. And what I need you to realize is that this is not just a community of excellence. 
It's a community that's spreading hope actively today, today. And so if you're your most hopeful self when you leave here, you can spread hope throughout your fair city. Now, how else do you spread hope? If I can have the slides again, please. The first thing you need to do is create and sustain excitement about the future. You want an engaged community. We ask people, does your leader make you excited about the future? If you say no, there's 0% likelihood that you're engaged with that leader and doing the things that that leader wants you to do. If you say yes, 69% of the people who said yes, their leader makes them excited about the future, is engaged in the pursuits that that leader has set forth. So creating excitement and sustaining excitement about the future is critical to leading with hope. The second one that's important is knocking down existing obstacles to goals and not putting up new ones. Strategic plans should not be obstacle ridden. They should be lofty goals that we're setting for ourselves that are inspiring the new generation of hopeful creatures. So the extent to which we're knocking down existing obstacles and not putting up new ones is vital to the success of the strategic plans that you all will talk about later today. One guy I want to tell you about is John Fetterman, who is a master of knocking down goals. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of Mayor John Fetterman. Okay. He, he is one of my favorite uh, city leaders. He's now running for Senate in Pennsylvania, but he was elected to be the mayor of Braddock, Pennsylvania. Now, there's a couple of things you need to know about John. He's six foot eight, 350 pounds with tons of tattoos. He's not your typical mayor looking guy. You also need to know that he won the mayor role by the slimmest of margins, one vote, one vote. But he took that vote as a mandate. He said, okay, now I'm going to lead. Braddock had lost 90% of its housing stock, 90% of its jobs. It was a food desert. And what he had to do was knock down the existing obstacles to growth and turnaround. One thing, the first thing he took on was that he reopened the playground. There hadn't been a playground in Braddock, Pennsylvania for 20 years. He reopened the playground. He then reached out to neighboring businesses and said, will you start a business in Braddock? And they got the first restaurant in Braddock in I think 10 years. It was a Subway restaurant. The first restaurant in Braddock in 10 years. And then he scored huge. He reached out to Levi's, uh, Levi's Jeans, Levi's Corporation, and said, wouldn't you love to do a commercial in Braddock, Pennsylvania? And oddly enough, they said yes. And they gave Braddock in return a million dollars to build a community center. This is one man leading with hope by first knocking down obstacles. The last thing that I want you to do as a leader is to re-goal. So every now and then, you're gonna realize that the goals you've set forth are not the goals that you should be pursuing any longer. We sometimes have to let go of old goals so that we can have the passion and excitement left over for new goals. So re-goaling is a critical, critical strategy. Now, I wanna leave you with a quote that I love about about hope and its contagious effect. So if we could have that slide up, please. Each time a man stands forth, for an, stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Hope matters, hope can be learned, and hope is contagious. Your job now is to spread ripples of hope. Thank you so much.
You know, you got to hear for yourself. This is exactly the message I think that's timely for San Bernardino City. You heard the power at the last story of one mayor in one city uh, making a difference. And here we have, you know, hundreds of people gathered uh, to send out that ripple and message of hope. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, just help and, and join me again in thanking Dr. Shane Lopez for his message. And I know Linda Bardier now has some other announcements for us as we uh, get started here on a long needed break, I'm sure, and uh, next steps. Thank you again to Dr. Shane, Dr. Shane Lopez. Um, that was such an inspiring speech. And if you're interested in reading more about Shane's work and some of the stories that he shared, please remember that we are selling copies of Making Hope Happen. And you can support the Making Hope Happen Foundation by buying Shane's book. Before we take a short break, I want to acknowledge a few people who worked on today's event. Thanks to the communications and printing services staff for the San Bernardino School District for making the event a success. Let's give them a round of applause. Also, special thanks to the maintenance and operations crew and our district police for also ensuring our safety. And we're going to take about a 10 minute break. And when we return, we will be having a panel discussion. So enjoy the break, make your way back to buy a book and we will be back in 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seat. We are about to begin the panel discussion for hope in our community. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our Gathering for Excellence program. If you are inspired by the comments and the hope that you've heard discussed today, let's give a big round of applause to all that have worked on this event. I wanted to share that if you're interested in the PowerPoint that Dr. Shane Lopez presented, that will be available on our district website. So the PowerPoint will be available. And we are now going to segue into a panel discussion on hope in our community. Dr. Shane Lopez will be our moderator and I'd like to introduce the panelists. On my right, Assembly Member Cheryl Brown. County Supervisor Chairman James Ramos. <laughs> County Superintendent Ted Alejandre. <laughs> Next to him, the Mayor of San Bernardino, Mr. Kerry Davis. <laughs> Superintendent Dr. Del Marston. And here on my left, Dr. Gloria Fisher, president of Valley College. Next to her, Dr. Richard Hart, president of Loma Linda University. Next to him is Dr. Tomas Morales, the president of Cal State San Bernardino. And then we have Chancellor Kim Wilcox from UC Riverside. our County Administrator, Greg Devereaux. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming back to the stage our moderator, who's going to facilitate the panel discussion. Let's give a round of applause to Dr. Shane Lopez. Welcome back. Um, we're gonna start with the hardest of the questions and then we'll, we'll get the softballs later, okay? You're okay? And we're gonna start with Assemblywoman Brown, if that's okay. Um, what do you suggest we do to improve educational outcomes for children of this community? 
First of all, I think you have to make sure that children are first, and that's your mission. <clears throat> and if children are your mission, then you'll look at their emotional well-being, you'll look at everything that they have in their, in their lives, and I think that that will help us. We did several pieces of legislation that, you'll, uh, that will go into effect in January, but as we go on with the day, I'll talk about that. But I think that we need to really look at making children and students first in our district. Excellent. Next. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I believe working uh, for the educational outcomes for the children is to continue to work in a collaborative effort. Certainly once you identify at a, at a young age what job opportunities there are in our own community, you start to build that, that energy within that educational um, person and the achievement there to start to transpire from the early age from zero to five to elementary to middle school to high school because now you see something that has a net worth of it with it at the end. And so that's bringing everybody together within the community to identify the possible outcomes that are there, not only within the educational attainment, but the job opportunities that rely here in San Bernardino County. Next, Ted. These are really historic and pivotal times in education in California. We've never experienced them before. And when we look at the development of our local priorities through our local control accountability plans, we really see three elements that are so critical. And that's student outcomes, conditions of learning, and stakeholder engagement because we have the local priorities met through local control. And I emphasize what Dr. Marsden mentioned earlier and that districts are adopting the cradle to career roadmap because if we can look at those key benchmarks to provide the mindset and disposition for all students cradle through career, not just from an academic standpoint, but from a social emotional standpoint, we can make hope happen and make our students successful. <clears throat> Wonderful. Mayor? Well, I think there are a couple of things, one of which is to just smile and talk positively to our youth and uh, give them the hope that we've been talking about. I think just a daily smile as we engage them uh, helps to uh, encourage their, uh, them smiling back at us. Also, I think continuing to support the plan of adjustment and our recovery plan that is currently being uh, put forth through the uh, bankruptcy court. I think that it's important that we, we stay the road, we stay the course, and we make sure that we stay on, ta <clears throat> on task with that road. You heard a lot from me earlier, but I'll tell you two things that our district is doing currently right now. We are establishing an alumni foundation for uh, former students of San Bernardino City Unified School District to have uh, pictures like you see the military pictured around the community, our current uh, young people that are serving in the military. Well, our goal is to have pictures of our alum around our schools oh, so kids great. have a model of the success and those, then bring those alum uh, back to work with our young people. Secondly, uh, we've allotted, because of our action of our school board on the local control funding formula, every school is, has been asked to have an entire grade level of students with their parents go on a university or college tour. So to all my college and university uh, family on my left, uh, get ready for the flood of people coming your way because that's going to happen here soon. So I think if we bring the parents with the kids to the world of university, to the world of work, that'll begin to help more young people and their families become successful. That's fascinating. Um, and over here, Dr. Fisher? Yes, at San Bernardino Valley College, we had the opportunity to have more students at an earlier age, at a younger age, come to the college to be exposed to the variety of programs that are available there. And we know that this makes a difference. Just recently we had the STEM Palooza event. And because math and science is so important, we now have ways that we are going about reaching students to get them engaged at an earlier age by being involved on the site. And we know that this is making a difference. Yes, sir. Well, I'm a great believer in mentoring and uh, particularly students to students. So the whole issue of trying to encourage our students and their professional programs to connect with high school students, elementary students, uh, just to become friends and talk about their dreams, I think is one of the greatest motivators uh, to bring students along the way. Mm -hmm. Dr. Morales? 
I think we got to raise expectations and support students to meet those expectations. We got to pay attention to early childhood education, third grade reading levels, and we should ensure that every student completes the A through G mm -hmm. curriculum so that, so that they're ready to go on to college or, or, to, a, or to a career. Uh, basketball coaches, orchestra conductors, choral conductors talk about two kinds of skills. They talk about individual skills. You have to learn how to finger the clarinet or move to your left if you're a basketball player. And they talk about ensemble skills. Those things you can't do by yourself, you have to do only in rehearsal with everybody else there. And I think today's discussion is a great example of both of those. The notions of hope is something we can each do individually and, and need to do individually. But this gathering and the kinds of things that the superintendent talked about earlier, these ensemble activities, I think are what's going to help to define us. Mm -hmm. The extent to which we all come away with the continuing commitment that we know we have here in the Inland Empire and find the effective ways to be an ensemble, I think we're going to be successful. Nice. As a community, we have to understand that educating our children sim isn't simply the, uh, in the purview and isn't simply the responsibility of the educators. It's the responsibility of the entire community, and we have to support the educators in educating our children. So whether it's business, labor, nonprofits, or government, we have to find a way to support our educators in helping to educate our children. Let's stick with the support and partnership theme and talk about um, the next question. How might our partnerships impact the well-being of our city and our region? How might our partnerships impact the well-being of our city and our region? So why don't we start here and work our way this way? So Greg, you go ahead again. Well, I think that one of the things that came out of the countywide vision was that there are certain elements that really make a complete community. And all of those elements are interrelated and interdependent. And most importantly, they're all of our responsibility because none of us can succeed without the other. You're not going to have the kind of high wage jobs you want unless you have an educated workforce. You're not going to have an educated workforce if children aren't healthy enough to stay in school and on and on. So all of those elements that make up the community are all of our responsibility. And when we come together and work collectively and collaboratively toward reaching those goals, we will achieve them much more quickly. And, and Greg talks from the county side, from the higher education side, it's the same thing. Uh, the community is our classroom, whether it's internships or uh, private experience. The, we can't just do everything we need to do educationally on campus. And at the same time, we talk about high tech jobs. Part of our job is not only to prepare students for those jobs, but also to bring those jobs to the area. So a lot of our research and economic development is focused on that capacity that is here in the Inland Empire that hasn't been realized. So the, the notion of an on-campus and off-campus split is becoming less and less as time goes on. I'll follow uh, uh, Kim's uh, comments. Uh, Cal State San Bernardino is an anchor institution. Our students are out in the community. Our faculty and staff are out in the community. And partnerships are critical, a collective impact approach so that we're working with our K-12 partners, our higher education partners, our business, and nonprofit partners critical to moving the dial. And certainly this gathering uh, gives us an opportunity to reconnect with each other as we move this, un this community forward. Mm -hmm. When Loma Linda was looking at the option of trying to expand clinical care in San Bernardino, we recognize that good health and health care is a necessary part of development, but not sufficient by itself to leverage a community uh, in its advancement. And that's when this idea of coming up of partnering with the school district, with the county, with so many other entities to try to create our San Bernardino campus with a gateway college with the intention of specifically preparing young people with job entry skills uh, it came about. And we're delighted that's moving forward. Mm -hmm. Middle College High School is one of the best examples of a partnership between a community college and a K-12 system. And it's a successful program built on a strong relationship we know that we need to expand those relationships beyond the middle college model. There is a new bill, a law actually, AB, AB 288, that will take effect 
in January of this next year, which opens the door to additional partnerships with other educational institutions so that students will not only receive their college instruction at the community college, but we have greater latitude in going out to the community and to <coughs> the high schools to offer education. So this is going to make a tremendous difference in the number of students and adults that we will be able to reach with education from the college. And Dale, um, same question. How might our partnerships impact the well-being of our city and our region? Yeah, I think one outcome, even from today's meeting, you know, earlier I mentioned over 7,000 of our high school students are engaged in career pathways. And as we think about flipping that engagement paradigm, especially at the high school level, where instead of kids being less engaged, becoming more engaged, we have the partners right here among us that I am certain we each represent collectively well more than 7,000 jobs that we can give our kids opportunity to mentor and observe and watch others engaged in, you know, highly skilled, highly competent workforce areas, whether it's from our county to our university system, to our healthcare industries, uh, to our legislative branch, et cetera. Uh, these are areas that our kids can immediately become engaged in and, and break down the paradigm of schooling being just within the four walls of a campus. I think that's our next step. Well, I, I think that we've already seen some results as a result of the partnerships that we've been developing. As you might recall, back in February, as I mentioned, we developed a, a process by which we tried to engage the community. We held five community forums. As a result of that, then we built a team of 17 community members to help take that information and craft a strategic plan. And so the result of that was that strategic th plan was then incorporated into our bankruptcy recovery plan. So you've seen the event, you've seen the effects already of that partnership. I think one of the areas that we need to strengthen, though, is to reach out and work a little more closely with our business leaders to make sure that they, we understand their needs so that that skill gap can be reduced as we try to match the needs of the employers with the training that's coming out of our schools. You know, I mentioned the local control accountability plan and two of the priorities that are emerging from all the districts within our county. And you know, there's 33 districts in our county. One of them has to do with college and career readiness. And it's such a privilege to be among three anchor units, including Cal State San Bernardino and the Inland Empire Economic Partnership and County Superintendent of Schools, to convene a regional hub of excellence, which really focuses on building and supporting the pathways of seven of our largest link learning districts, including San Bernardino City Unified, so we can develop those pathways that focus on the industry sectors where students will have the most hope in obtaining the jobs in our region. That work is convening amongst individuals that are committed to the process. And the second area is building the support for students along the social emotional needs because we have so many students who come from poverty throughout the county. Now, this morning I spoke at Bank of America's annual event where they recognize nonprofits in San Bernardino Riverside County. These nonprofits are providing the wraparound support services to so many of our students. Those partnerships enable us to meet that critical need so that every student can be successful. Thank you. I think first the community um, has to truly embrace education and acknowledge that education is the baseline of any striving economy um, in, our, in our region because then things start to happen. Once we embrace education and we totally acknowledge that that's the baseline to start to build on, we start to see things start to move forward. Certainly we'll start to see the countywide vision, which calls on all sectors of the community to start to work together and identify those areas that are there areas that start to implement job training at an early age. If we're waiting until 11th grade, 12th grade to start to identify those jobs, we're missing, we're missing the boat. We have to start to identify those early on in the early ages of the students that are in our area. But for the community to acknowledge that and embrace it with the business leaders, with the community leaders, because two things will start to happen. You'll start to see the job retention in our area and the promotion of those jobs that will start to be well-paying jobs in our area, and you'll start to see that money, that, that economies of scale being retained in our region. So you'll start to see our region and our cities start to prosper uh, on that aspect of it. But it starts with believing in education and understanding that that's the baseline of any striving economy. You know, being true partners is not me giving 50% and you given 50%. Being true partners is maybe you giving 110 and the other person or the other partner given 110%.
And that's what we need is true partnerships in our community. As a, as a legislator, I do the things that um, we're supposed to do. And as was mentioned early, AB 288 was one of the bills that I championed. I championed that bill because uh, it's, it's dual enrollment. And what happened is my own granddaughter will graduate from um, high school, middle, middle college, and she will graduate from San Bernardino Valley College at the same time this coming June. So those are the things that we do in Sacramento. It was such a good program that we had, we have a bill now that allows it all over the, oops, excuse me, all over the state. Excellent, excellent. Um, Mayor, you mentioned the, the skill gap between employers' needs and workers' skills. Why don't we tackle that question? How do your strategic plans address the skill gap between employers' needs and workers' skills? And let's start with Dr. Fisher, if we could. I think it's important to in, involve the advisory committees. At the college, each of the career technical education programs has an advisory committee. And what we've seen over the past years is that many of the members of the committee are comprised of faculty and interested people, but not as many people from the actual industries. So we are forging more relationships with industry partners, and we know that we then are in a better position to provide what it is that they need in terms of skills. Our strategic plan, which is being updated this year, includes a major component with regard to what direction are we going to be going in the near future to meet the needs of the industry that is located in our region. So we want to hear from the people who need the skilled workers to know what they need and make sure that our curriculum aligns with those needs and that we deliver a great product to them, a well-trained employee. Dr. Hart. For many jobs, certainly in the healthcare industry, head knowledge is only the beginning and it's developing a skill set an orientation of professionalism that's critical. And so that's why I think having students in their training be able to get practical experience in the real world while they're going through training is absolutely essential. And that's the, the goal that we wanted to have in our San Bernardino campus. Wonderful. Yes, sir. You know, we just completed our strategic plan this year and, and many folks in this room and on, on this panel participated as community members and we have five goals, student success, because clearly it's all about our students. Faculty and staff success, because our students cannot be successful unless our employees are successful, unless our faculty and staff are successful. Resources and sustainability, how do we do leverage our partnerships? How do we leverage the resources? Community engagement and partnership, how do we expand those partnerships between the university and the community, and then our identity. What, what, what are we as an institution, and what do we mean for the city of San Bernardino and the region? And I think that's really the uh, centrality of the approach that we take in developing our partnerships. Uh, there are really two, two sides to it for us at UCR. One is, just as Dr. Fisher was, uh, pointed out, uh, there's a, a sense of what we can do for the industries that are here, and a great example of that is the logistics industry. We think of people driving trucks and moving freight, and that's a key part of it, but there are also people who write the software and develop the, the protocols for actually managing a worldwide uh, freight system. And we are right now actively working on our campus and with partners in China uh, to, to manage this global network. Uh, and that's, that's kind of today, but we're also very focused on tomorrow. Uh, how do we create a biotech industry in the Inland Empire? How do we uh, jumpstart an even more active, uh, advanced and clean manufacturing industry in the Inland Empire? So we have a set of research processes focused on that, that future, that hopeful part mm -hmm. of, of the Inland Empire's future. As a county, um, our, uh, our economic development agency and our workforce investment board are always working with business and the educational community to make sure that their efforts are aligned, that the, the educational community is providing programs that really are developing the skills that business and industry needs. 
on a whole other tack, um, our uh, vision education element group uh, also works with business and especially the Alliance for Education that, uh, doc, that uh, our superintendent, Ted Alejandre, uh, heads to make sure that in every school district, we're working to help create the career pathways and the linked learning that's necessary for those kids to have those skill sets. Okay, back to this side. Again, how does your strategic plan address the skill gap between employers' needs and workers' skills? Dale? Yeah, I know we just have about three minutes on our panel left, but I, do, I will just briefly say one thing that we're specifically doing that's in our strategic plan is we have our staff, uh, as well as students, going out into those worlds of industry. For example, at Norton Elementary School, we had our staff, as well as the students, went out to advanced manufacturing industry to see what does that look like and to get certified in those areas so when they come back, they're speaking from a point with the career pathways at the elementary level even, here's what industry requires, here's what they demand, I'm certified to do it, I can tell you how to be successful as a student. So getting that real world experience face-to-face uh, -face with industry, I think, is one key element of our plan. And a few quick comments from the remaining panelists. Well, it's not by mistake that uh, incorporated into our priority goals is education workforce development. And quickly what that stated was, we are a city that embraces the concept of lifelong learning. Together with our educational partners, we will provide a network of support services from birth through retirement that optimizes the educational and job training opportunities for all residents of all ages. And so it's um, uh, this group that's on this panel here helped to formulate our, our priority goals. And that was one of the seven that we established for the city of San Bernardino. Excellent. I think the leverage right now that we have as school districts in our county and in our state is that due to the efforts of people like Assemblymember Brown, who allows districts to utilize their school funding for discretionary uses, it's all flexible dollars included in that funding formula is an augmentation from grades 9 through 12 for career tech and ROP. And as we're seeing in our county, especially in our regional hub, is that those career pathways are tied to those industry sectors where we know those jobs will be when students graduate. And they're tied to and becoming more involved and tied to meeting A through G requirements. So if we can prepare students for college and career through that kind of a focus, our students will be prepared after they graduate from high school. I think continuing to build on the partnerships between business, government, and education, all working together, together in a collaborative unit to identify the needs of that um, skill gap of that worker that we need to fill the jobs that are there. And also being open to evolve with technology so that we're always on the cutting edge of giving the workforce that, that uh, employee that we need in our region. That means identifying the workforce that we need drastically in our region and promoting that and it's because of the partnerships that come together that we continue to evolve and make sure that we are putting out that employee for the workforce. And final hopeful words from Assemblywoman <laughs> Brown. One of the things that we were able to do this year was to have a select committee on small business in the Inland Empire. What that committee and what that meeting did was to look at what's currently being done and what needs to be done in the future. We discussed the disconnect between our our youth, our, our students, and the jobs that they're going to somehow fill. And we know that there's a shortfall. However, this year, we knew, wait, I should say, we know that we have, it takes money. It takes money to do these things. So this year, we were able to add $7.6 billion on top of a $6.1 billion increase from the last two years in funding for public schools. We also um, added a billion dollars for technical education. We provided $7.9 billion this year for community colleges, and that's a $700 million increase over last year. We are working very hard to make sure that the work that you're doing here can be continued with the funding that's absolutely necessary. So when we go back, I'll, I'll put on red socks again for uh, Cal State. <laughs> and, um, and we'll do what we can to uh, promote more money in the budget for education. 
And on that hopeful note, I want to thank our panelists. And thank you to Shane for leading the discussion. And ladies and gentlemen, Shane is going to be available in the back to do a signing of the Making Hope Happen books. But before we get to that, I would like to now, ladies and gentlemen, give you an opportunity to meet our facilitator for our group activity. I would like to invite Mr. Aldo Ramirez, the Directory, Director of Family Engagement, to come forward and give us our charge. Thank you, Linda. Good morning, everybody. I know the table activity sits between lunch and this moment <laughs> in time right now. So I would like to be very brief and give you the best instructions for going through the table activity as possible. Now, the table activity, the objective is for all of you who hopefully have heard as loud and clear as I have from our leaders up here, our wonderful formal leaders, that in order to make hope happen in San Bernardino in a powerful way, we need to work collaboratively. Now, that idea is espoused up here and reinforced. And the people that do a lot of this work and that are the participants in this work are actually sitting out here in our audience. We recognize that your skill, knowledge, and insight is important to help this work move forward efficiently. And that's the objective of the table activity. We would like to collect your collective thoughts on what the most important and key things we can do this year to impact our community in a powerful way are. And that's what our table activity is designed to do. So, giving you a little bit of that background, I would like to now give you the instructions for the table activity. And let me pull out my technology real quick because I want to make sure I do this the best that I can. So, step one for the table activity, if you are sitting at a table with more than four people, when I say go in a little bit, the first step is to split off into two groups. So if you are sitting in a table with more than four people, you will divide into two groups. Secondly, at each of the tables, we have placed summaries of two different plans from our different organizations that are up here. You will use these plans by going over them and any other additional materials that are there by yourselves first. Take about five minutes to do that. That's step number two. Step number three. In the groups that you are in, choose one person to facilitate and record your conversations. The facilitator will use the Chromebook, it looks like this, at the table. You will have to open the Chromebook. The password is written on a little sticky on the Chromebook. If for some reason the sticky is not on that Chromebook, it's the same password as your neighbor's Chromebook. Yeah. It's orange show, no caps. Open the, open the Chromebook, put the password in, open up the Google Chrome, and when you open up the Google Chrome, there will be a small icon up to the left-hand side with a survey monkey. Click on the survey monkey. 
that'll open up your questions that you will be asking the group and responding to. So once the facilitator has done that, then please start your conversation and record your collective wisdom on that form. You will have 25 minutes to complete the activity and I will give you a five minute warning when we're getting close to that time. So, I'm gonna recap the instructions real quick. If you're in a table with more than four people, divide into two groups. Review the plans that are at your table. They're different at each table. Choose your facilitator and answer the questions. All right, everybody, we look forward to getting all of that feedback. Ready, set, go. Team, just a quick message about translation. All of the materials have been translated and the questions are translated in a couple of documents that are at each of the tables. So if you need translation for Spanish, it'll be at the tables. Un breve mensaje acerca de traducción. Los documentos han sido traducidos. Las preguntas en la computadora no están traducidas, pero hay dos documentos en cada mesa donde están traducidas las preguntas. Por favor, úsenlos si lo necesitan. Team, pardon the interruption one more time. Uh, I have just been informed that some of the Chromebooks might not be connecting. If your Chromebook does not connect, please feel free to use the paper copy of the questions that's at the table. Uh, we will collect the paper copy of the questions.
team, I do want to reiterate, if you are having any kind of con connectivity issues with your device, please feel free to just fill out the paper copy. I've also been informed by our IT that there is probably gonna be a good likelihood that you will be able to be connected in a few moments once several of our groups have already inputted the data and are no longer connected to the survey. So two options. One, please fill out the paper copy. Two, if you hold on for a second, you'll probably be able to be connected in a few minutes.
We have five minutes left. Five minutes left for the table discussion. Team, two-minute warning. If you are not at your table, please make your way back to your table so we can wrap up the table activity. Two-minute warning.
All right, everybody. If I could have your attention, please. We would like to thank all of you for giving us all of your insights and recommendations. Please be assured that we will read through all of these and share them with our formal leaders so that it could guide the work that we do as we move forward uh, over this next year of work that we hope will make a huge impact in our city and definitely raise the hope that all of our city citizens have for their future. I would like to turn the mic back over to Ms. Linda Bardier. Let's give her a big round of applause. Linda works very hard on all of these events and we're very proud of her. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you, Aldo, and thanks to all of you who participated in this key activity. I hope that you noticed at the end of the survey there was an opportunity for you to volunteer, as Dr. Marsden had requested, if you would like to continue in the work of our community. I just want to take two or three minutes to thank a couple of more key people, and then I will share the directions for the lunch dismissal. Thank you to all of our partners who helped ensure the success of today's events, especially Jiggs Gallagher from Loma Linda University. I think he's still here, he's great. Joe Gutierrez and his team at Cal State San Bernardino. Evelyn Estrada and Monica Lagos from the city of San Bernardino. Paul Brotlin from San Bernardino Valley College. Thanks, Paul. Christine McGrew from the County Superintendent Ted Alejandre's office. And of course, our key sponsors, Desert Fiat. Let's give them a big round of applause. They're a platinum level sponsor. And then, Cal State San Bernardino, Loma Linda University, the County of San Bernardino, the City of San Bernardino, San Bernardino Valley College, San Bernardino County Superintendent of Schools, UC Riverside, Vector USA, Think Wise Credit Union, Leaf Wing, PCH Architects, Capital Advisors Group, Synetics, and Alcott and Fade. So let's give all of our sponsors a big round of applause. And one last thing before lunch, please pull out your calendar. Get your calendars out. Open them up. Scroll through until you get to November 10th, 2016, a year from today. Please plan on joining us again next year on November 10th, 2016, when we hear from Jim Clifton, the CEO and chairman of Gallup Research and Polling and the author of The Coming Jobs War. That's November 10th, 2016. And so that we can have an orderly lunch, our ex exemplary staff from the National Orange Show has buffet leaders. These captains will dismiss each section of the room. You're just gonna go to the back. You're gonna grab your sandwich of choice. Drinks are to each side of the table. And I am sure you will enjoy your lunch and that you will have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you and enjoy your lunch.